where a, a small church is ours. Uh, we did end up, uh, Elaine and Bruce brought more boxes today. So we ended up packing 140 now, is what we're up to? Somewhere around there. Somewhere around there, yeah. So we, we got close, we got close. But we did get the 75 for the 10 to 14 year olds, so that, that is important. Uh, it, it was important to me that we not neglect that age group, which does tend to get neglected in the uh, in the distribution. Go ahead. Do, do I understand then that the pumps and the coloring books are no longer needed? Uh, no, uh, we the pumps should get here today. Actually, uh, I'm still waiting for confirmation from Amazon that they're being delivered. Uh, the coloring books will. Uh, I'll I'll be going shopping this weekend and get the coloring. So yeah, we, we did need one or two little things, but uh, those will be covered uh, over the next week or two. Uh, collection doesn't start until the 18th, right? The week, the week before Thanksgiving. The week before Thanksgiving, so yeah. What was that, Mary? The 15th to the 18th is what I heard. The 15th to the 18th, yeah, that sounds right. about yeah. right. So we have time. We have time to finish, uh, you know, that there are, like I said, little things that are needed for individual boxes, but those will be filled. So in the end, it'll be about 140 boxes. And if you guys, uh, in the next couple of weeks, if you guys want to fill any more boxes, please feel free. Um, you'll be filling them from scratch because we use just about everything that we had. So, <laughs> uh, so praise the Lord. It's it's good. Uh, Juanita said she took down some numbers. I actually have all of the uh, all of the numbers that that were all of the stickers that were put on the boxes, I, I saved the uh, the numbers. So I'm going to be picking a few at random and and checking them online. So come Christmas time, I'll you know we'll share where those boxes ended up, and you know uh, we'll be able to rejoice with the, with those people. Still need right. postage, right? Huh? Still need postage. Yes, I mean, if anybody wants to make a donation to help pay for uh, the $10 donation per box. So uh, do the math. We have 140 boxes, $10 per box. We're going to have to pay $1,400. So if you'd like to make a donation to that, it is greatly appreciated. Anything else? I think that's it, right? We are still doing Wednesday evening prayer and Bible study. We've got, I think it's three lessons left in this uh, current series, which is amazing. I I can't believe how quickly this, this has flown by, but it has been such an interesting series. Uh, it's called The Truth and True Crime. Uh, there is a book out by that name. Uh, the, the study series is based on the book. So if you uh, are interested in reading the book, you can buy it um, wherever you buy your books. So, um, but yeah, we've got three more, three more left in that series. All right, so today I want to start a new uh, sermon series or discussion series on the parables of Jesus. And today we're going to start with Luke chapter 15. Uh, Jesus tells three parables in this, uh, in this chapter in answer to a question that he received. In 15.1, uh, we read, now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way I tell you there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So, having heard that, before we get to the third parable that, that, he, uh, that he tells in this chapter, uh, what do you think we can learn from what Jesus just said? You guys should be ready for these questions. <laughs> what do you think? There's Go ahead. A party in heaven with so many good things. 
there is a party in heaven. You know what's interesting about that? Let me read that last sentence. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. If it's not the angels that are rejoicing, if, if the rejoicing is happening in the presence of the angels, who is it that's rejoicing? Probably the saints. It could be the saints, or it also could be God himself. See, we don't think that way, do we? None of us thinks about God rejoicing, do we? I mean, it, I, I know, look, uh, for those of you who are of my generation, we grew up with a very stern God, right? That God that was always like this. <laughs> don't you do that. You know, and that's not the God that exists. That's not the true God. God actually rejoices. Jesus said there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels. That means he, the Father, and the Holy Spirit are rejoicing when a, a sinner comes to repentance. So that is part of one of the answers that I have here. What else? What else can we learn from this? And that's, that's the first point I have here. Every single one of us is incredibly valuable to God. Just one. Now we, again, we don't always think that way, right? And especially as a pastor, right? Pastors, uh, we judge the work of God by the size of our congregation, which is not the way we should be judging the work of God. It's, you know, it's not the size of the congregation. What's, what matters is how you are affecting the people in your congregation. I mean, quite frankly, Jesus had a congregation of 12 people, right? That's about the size of this church. So, you know what? I can, I can be happy because Jesus said that we would do greater things than his. And sometimes we have like 15 or 20 people. So, so God's word has been fulfilled if we have more than 12 people. But... The one thing that I have noticed, and, and, I've, and I've had these discussions with pastors before, because I, I had a, a the, the, the worst argument I had with a pastor was he wanted to stop having Wednesday night because only about uh, half of the congregation showed up for Wednesday. And my point has always been, and I, and I told them this, I said, look, don't those people matter? Doesn't it matter? Now, we had a congregation of, of about 70 people at that time. So about 30, 35 people came for Wednesday night. I said, don't those 35 people matter? I said, why does it matter if, you know, if even one person comes? Doesn't that matter? And we find out here in Scripture that, yeah, it matters. That it matters so much to God that he is going to stop what he's doing, and he is going to go and pursue that one person. And I can tell you from experience but that is true because I was that lost sheep at one time. I was the one that wandered away from the rest of the herd. And I needed the shepherd to come and find me. And, and listen to what he's saying. In both instances, he says, uh, don't they search until they find it. God doesn't stop, guys. God doesn't give up. If he doesn't find you like in a day or an hour or, or whatever, he will keep searching. He will keep looking. He will keep calling until he finds you. And praise God for that because if it wasn't for that, I would not be here. God Almighty kept pursuing me. Now, you would never have known that if you had known me back then. My mother did not know that her prayers were having us. And my mother, greatest prayer warrior I know, okay? And my mother prayed desperately for me day after day after day after day. And she tells me that there were days that she almost gave up on me because she never saw anything happen. But I can tell you that there was something going on in here during that time. You may not have seen it here, but there was something going on here. I knew that the father, that the shepherd was looking for me during that time. And he is not going to stop 
until he finds you. That's how valuable you are. And that's why he uses these analogies. A silver coin back then was pretty valuable. But you got you to gotta think about this. Back in those days, a woman would often receive 10 silver coins as a wedding gift. So not, not only did these coins have monetary value, but they had a sentimental value to her as well. And it's the same thing with the sheep. Like shepherds, there is nothing in the world more valuable to a shepherd than a sheep, right? I mean, the, and, and Jesus says that when, when the shepherd finds it, he doesn't just lead it back, right? He puts the sheep on his shoulder and he takes it back. He's not taking any chances that this sheep is going to go wandering off again, right? That's how valuable this sheep is. He doesn't just say, all right, come on, and if you wander off again, I'm not going to come find you this time. No, no, no. He picks that sheep up, puts it on his shoulder, and says, all right, you, we got this. And he goes and he takes the sheep out. So here's my question. Since I'm talking to uh, a bunch of, of veterans here, I assume every one of you is sick. Why is it that we're so quick to give up on people? I love, I love the reactions. <laughs> I, just, I just, like those knowing looks on all your face, like, yeah, I know, yeah. I know. <laughs> you guys weren't expecting that question, were you? <laughs> what were you saying? We're not God, I know. <laughs> Very true. Go ahead. God has the resources to be strong. We don't. I'm gonna I, I'm gonna say that's true uh, from from a, a um, from a real a real property type of perspective. Like I don't have unlimited money to go, you know, bailing somebody out when they go to jail or, or something like that. So you're right about that. But we do have we do have access to all of the resources. That, that the spiritual resources that we need in order to, you know, to pursue people. Um, but yeah, there, there are times that there's only so much we can do, right? There, there comes a point where you got to cut people off and say, listen, I just can't help you anymore. And part of it is the heart's not in place to receive the solution that you offer them. So, I mean, well, that's, but see, this is my point. In a, in a sense, you are correct. But you would have said that about me 28 years ago, before I came back to the Lord 27 years ago. You would have said the same thing about me, that, hey, his heart just isn't in a right place. He's not going to receive what I have. And you would have been wrong. Now, every... Well, how do I want to put this? This is, this is the example. I'll, I'll use the example of a, of a scale, right? So you have a, a, a scale, like Lady Justice is always, is always pictured as holding a scale, right? So if you put uh, something in one side of the scale, it's going to be imbalanced, right? So we can picture this idea of trying to bring a scale back into balance. Everything that you put on the one side of the scale does make a difference even if you can't see it. So even if like there's 100 pounds on this side, and I add one pound on that side, you may not see the scale move at all, but it does make a difference. So what we are doing a lot of times, and Paul, Paul talks about this in terms of sowing and watering, right? So Paul says that some people sow the seed, other people water it. It's God who makes it grow, and that's the distinction. We need to understand that we can't save anybody. All we are doing is we are making the road easier for that person to come back. So I can I can picture myself as a uh, as a, as a road paver, right? People have have come and and they've gone away from the Lord, and the road is all messed up and and all of that. And I've got to pave the road so that it's a smooth ride for them to come back. That's really all I see my job as. It's just removing obstacles because I can't bring them back. If if I could. I would be out there doing that, right? If I could bring people to Jesus just by force of will or by preaching sermons or anything like that, I would be out there every every minute of every day just doing what I could. But I can't. I, I don't. I can't convince people. I can't uh, bring people to Jesus Christ. But what I can do 
is I can plant the seed. And then you come, you come along later on and you water that seed. And you know, you confirm the message for that person. And then God is the one that shines the sun on that and causes it to grow. Anybody else? Why do we give up so easily on people? Go ahead. It could be a lot of uncertainty in a bunch of different areas. So on the one hand, may not necessarily be giving up per se, but it's like, what if I'm saying the wrong thing, you're not doing right. It's like, it'd be better if I just stopped and let somebody else handle it. Or it could be simply because we're finite. We can only exist in the time we're existing in. We're not God and we can't see the future. We can't see how this person is going to react and if they're going to change. And so, especially if it's taking years upon years, you, you kind of just get burnt out. I, yeah, I mean, and I've experienced that with certain people where it's like, I, I just don't know what else to do, right? It's like you do come to the end of your rope at some point. And in that regard, yeah, it's, it's not that we're giving up on them. Uh, I think what we need to do is just turn them over to God. And say, God, I've done all that I can do. But you've got to do the rest. I mean, and I, and I say this all the time, guys. If you do what you can do, God will do what you can't do. And, and that's the important distinction. It's like, look, you, like I said before, you can't bring them to God. You're not going to be the, you're, you're not going to bring them to God. The only one who can bring them to God is Jesus, right? But again, if you have done what you can, you expressed your love for that person. You told them you're praying for them, and you do pray for them. You don't just tell them you're praying for them and then not pray for them, right? You actually pray for them. Sometimes, yeah, you got to take your hands off of it. Like the Bible says, be still and know that he is God. So sometimes, and that is the hardest thing in the world, especially for people like me, because I am what you would call a fixer, right? I want to fix things. I don't want to just leave them broken. I drop out of my crazy on that point, all right? Because if something's going on, I want to dig into it, and I want to figure out what's wrong. But we know, husbands, testify with me, that that's not always the way you're supposed to work with your wife, right? <laughs> Sometimes the husband needs to just take a step back, let their wife vent, and eventually she'll let you know if she needs something from you. But of course, we're not wired that way, are we? When, when, when somebody has a problem, we want to jump in and we want to immediately, all right, let's do this, let's do that, we're going to do this, and we're going to do that, and your wife is just sitting there thinking, shut up. Just shut up for a second and listen to what I'm saying, right? And sometimes that's what we got to do. Sometimes we've got to just take a step back and, and realize there's nothing we can do. And, and I know how hard that is. I mean, especially when you're talking about someone you actually love or care about. It is the hardest thing in the world to take a step back and say, Lord, you're in your hands. Whatever happens, I'm, I'm going to trust you. And, and unfortunately, uh, what, what will most likely happen is that person will spiral and hit rock bottom. And that's the hardest thing in the world to watch. But sometimes we've got to let it happen and, and just let God work through those things. Anybody else? Yeah, and and that's why the Bible the Bible says that our cup runneth over, right? Well, what if your cup isn't running over, right? <laughs> what if you got just enough in the cup for yourself, right? You you can't afford to put, to put it out there for other people. And and look, I mean, there's a simple solution for that because God will fill your cup whenever you need it. You know, that's why the cup runs over because He's letting you know there's more than this. So if you are feeling that way, if you're kind of feeling uh, burnt out or tired. And look, we all get that. It is a common and, and understandable human emotion to feel burnout, especially when you're dealing with someone as hard-headed as I was back then, where you you feel like you're hitting your head against a brick wall constantly. Eventually you get tired, right? And you gotta kind of, you know, you gotta salve the wound for a while before hitting your head any further. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Bruce. You opened another area of thought when you said ten coins is usually the wedding gift. 
So that opens up the idea of relationship. Mm -hmm. Okay, God wants to restore relationship. And, you know, he goes after his sheep because it's his sheep, not mm -hmm. somebody else's sheep. You know what I'm saying? Relationship. So there's that relationship component that he is interested in restoring. And that's the whole purpose that he came to second Adam, to restore the relationship that Adam lost. That's right. And 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 that's why that's why the imagery here is so important. Because shepherds and their sheep had, you know, like I said, there was nothing more important to a shepherd than their sheep. You know, as Jesus said, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And we, we read that like with uh, with King David. Here's here's a the the most famous, well, the second most famous shepherd in the Bible, right after Jesus, is, is King David. And this is something the Israelites would have understood. When David went to fight Goliath, and Saul said, you can't fight Goliath, you're just a kid. He's been a warrior his whole life. And David said, listen, I've been tending my father's sheep. And when a, wolf, and when a lion or a bear came and took one of the sheep, I went after that, that lion or that bear. And I grabbed that lion or that bear by the, by the throat. And I and I took the sheep out of its mouth. That's the kind of love that God is, that Jesus is talking about here. That's the kind of, of, of ownership or relationship that you're talking about. That God is so invested in you that He's going to risk anything to come and rescue you. Just as King David was willing to risk anything to rescue his sheep. Not only is He there to rescue you, He's there to lead you. To the where you depend on him. And that's right. And that's and that's why the, the, the sheep analogy is so important. Because the sheep are are general generally speaking not the sharpest animals in the forest, right? <laughs> they have a tendency to wander and they need the shepherd to kind of make sure that they're you know walking in the right way. That's why in uh, Psalm Psalm 23, right, it said he leads me. Uh, to to uh, to good pastor, he leads me to still waters. Right, he leads me places where I can eat and drink and be safe. Matthew ten twenty nine thirty one says, "There are not ten sparrows sold for a penny, yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside of your father's care. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered." So don't be afraid; you are worth more than many sparrows. Zephaniah three seventeen: The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. There goes that, that image, right, of God rejoicing. We need to get that picture of God. God rejoices over you. He's, he's having a party in heaven. Whatever you do, what you're supposed to do, we might think to ourselves, like, oh, well, that's nothing, you know. You do what you're supposed to do. God is up in heaven going, yeah, that's it. That's what I'm talking about. Right? I'm a sports fan, right? We do that with our teams, right? When our team does something good, we're jumping up and like, yeah, all right! We gotta get a picture of God like that. That God actually does feel that. He gave us emotions because he has emotions. He feels joy. He feels pain. Or or hurt, I should say, not pain. He, he's disappointed when we when we do when we do wrong. But he also rejoices when we do right. Anything else? Anyone else? Before I move on. This is good. All right, so the second point here is that we are valuable, and because we are valuable, God will not stop pursuing us. Look at the imagery here, right? Like I said, the, the shepherd who goes out, and he does not stop looking until he finds the sheep. Jesus doesn't tell us how long it takes, because it doesn't matter. Because Jesus said it's, he's not going to stop. If it takes a day, if it takes two days, if it takes a hundred days, he's not going to stop until he finds that sheep. The same thing with a woman who loses her coin. She lights the lamp. Now look, we're, we're talking about a woman who's probably poor, right? And oil was expensive. You don't light the lamp unless you absolutely have to. But this is so important to her. She lights the lamp. She pulls the broom out of the closet and starts sweeping up. She doesn't just go looking on and think, okay, it's not there, no, it's not. No, no. She takes the broom and sweeps under every crack and crevice to make sure she does not miss a spot. And again, Jesus says she is not going to stop until she finds that coin. 
God is not going to stop that. Now look, we may have to stop and rest. We may have to take a break from people every once in a while. But God doesn't stop. Be, you can be confident in the fact that whoever it is you're praying for, God is at work right now. God is sweeping up that house trying to find them right now. God is searching the countryside for them right now. You can, be, you can believe that. During the eight years that I, that I was separated from God, I can tell you that there was not a day that went by that I did not feel the call of God. Again, you would not have known it. You would not have seen it here. And if you had asked me about it, I would have been like, hey, you know. But I can tell you, he was at work in here. He didn't stop. Ezekiel 34, 11 and 12. For this is what the Sovereign Lord says, I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. As a shepherd look, looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so will I look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on, the, on a day of clouds and darkness. That's the God that we serve. No matter where you are, he's going to find you. That's right. That's what the Bible says, right? Where can I go from your presence? Right. If I if I go to the highest mountain, you are there. If I go to the deepest depths, you are there. God is there. He is at work. And he's at work in every one of us. Whenever we stray, now we may come back immediately, but even when we stray, he's like, ah, 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 come back here. No, no. See, that's why, you know, when you look at the shepherd's staff, right, it has a hook on it. That's so when the sheep starts to stray, he throws that hook over there, ah, no, this way. And that's what God does for us. Mm -hmm. He's watching over every one of us. So he showed Glory and I uh, different little miracles when we were searching for him. Little did we know that we were searching for him until one, one afternoon on a Friday night, we were at we were involved in marriage encounter. And we went to this uh, prayer meeting. And Gloria, I had to sit behind her because there was no room in the front. And all of a sudden, she turned around and she says, Honey, my chair's lifting up off the floor. Something's wrong. And here was about this far off the floor. So I put my foot on it, bring it back down again. And they just kept on going and singing and everything. And I got tired of taking my foot off. And sure enough, the chair went back up and it went up to about six inches. And I had to put both of my feet on the chair to bring it down. So when the service was all over, she looked at me and I looked at her and I said, I think we better do something. He's telling us something, really. So she said, maybe you're right. Two weeks later, we went to Dale's Fort Abbey. And they were just singing and praising writing love letters to each other, tell us how much we love each other and everything. And uh, we had dinner and everything. It was all over about 10 o'clock when we went to bed. And uh, all of a sudden, I felt this shaking on me. And here, Gloria woke me up. She said, do you hear that noise? I said, I hear something. She said, I said, let me go look out in the hall. Here there was a man playing his guitar. And I said, hey, buddy, don't you know people are sleeping here? So he says, yeah, I know they're sleeping here, but we're trying to wake these people up to go to church. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, okay. I should do that, right? <laughs> so I went back in and I told Lori about it. She said, well, I think maybe we ought to go. So we went. And lo and behold, it was an amphitheater. You had to go from your seat down this way, not thinking what it was going to be like when you came back up. We went to communion, and uh, it was a lovely service. And on the way back, I said to her, are you holding my hand? And she said, no, dear, I'm not. I said, well, somebody's holding my hand. So we walk a little bit further, and I said, are you sure they're not holding my hand? She said, no. And she said to me, well, don't you think by now you know who's doing it? I said, yeah, but there's no but to lose Jesus. That's right. So I said to her, I said, well, 
Henry, after the service, when we were home, we were called the pastor and see what he's got to say. Maybe he can show us how to get to the Lord. And sure enough, we did. That Sunday night, I called the pastor and I told him, he says, can you come tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock? I said, yes. So we both went Monday morning and he asked us what was happening and we told him. That was many, that was one of many little incidents that was happening in our lives. And I said to the pastor, I said, you know, he's trying to tell us something, but we don't know what. So he says, here's what he's trying to tell you, that he loves you and he wants to continue taking care of you. All you have to do is listen to him. Come, I'll leave you to Jesus. It sounds so simple, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so he led us to Jesus and uh, I must say, for 63 years, my wife and I had a perfect marriage to, to the, the healing and the teaching of Jesus in our lives. And when yeah. he showed us what to do. And to this day, I'm still not ashamed to say that Jesus is on my side. Amen. Amen. And he's still with me. And, and, and you know what? As every one of us has a story, uh, a different story. God doesn't work with any of us the same way. But we all, it, the, it all comes to the same thing, that God is pursuing us. Yes. And he will continue to pursue us. That's the whole point. That is the whole point of the cross. The Bible says that God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, while we were still disobedient, while we were still rebellious, that's my commentary, that's not what the verse says, but <laughs> while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that's the that's the that's the whole that's the whole thing in a nutshell, is that he's going to keep pursuing you until he finds you. He's not going to stop. And whoever it is that you're praying for, uh, no matter how stubborn they are, no matter how much you think that your prayers are not having an effect, understand that God will continue to pursue that person. Anybody else? All right, the final point is, and this is the third uh, parable that he tells in this chapter, the final point is that no one is beyond redemption. And to, to illustrate this point, he tells the story of the prodigal son in verses 11 through 31. Now, we talked about the prodigal son, uh, the story of the prodigal son last week. We talked about the good one, right? The one who stayed home. But the story was uh, mostly about the one who left. The one who, who committed the grievous sin and left his father. And Jesus is, is, is telling us that even that person who, who basically uh, committed the greatest sin against his father that you can possibly commit. Because telling your father, give me my inheritance now, you're basically telling your father, I wish you were dead, I don't want to be your son anymore. So that is, at that, at that time, that was the worst insult any father could endure. And Jesus is saying that even that is not unforgivable. Even that is something that the father can forgive and love you through. No one is beyond his redemption. 1 John 1, 8 and 9, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So what does that say? It says that he will forgive. It doesn't say he will forgive you as long as you didn't do this, 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 or this. He's like, he will forgive you, but not for this over here. No, no. If we confess our sins, he will forgive you and cleanse you from how much unrighteousness? All of it. It doesn't say he will cleanse you from some unrighteousness. He will cleanse you from all of your unrighteousness except this unrighteousness over here. Because you know what? We all have something that we think is too much to forgive, right? Every one of us has something in mind where we think, well, that person got to go to hell. That person's got to get judged, right? For me, it's pedophiles. I have a hard time thinking a pedophile can be forgiven. But you know what? God can even forgive a pedophile. As he, as he heals that person's victims, he can even forgive that person. 
And that is a tough concept, guys. But you know what makes it tough? Is because we think we're better than we are. See, I think I'm better than a pep rock. Look, I am better than a pep rock. Oh, <laughs> The truth is that if I had died in my sins, I would have been in the same hell as that pedophile, even though I had never been one. I would have been standing right next to that person, even though my sins were, quote, unquote, better than that person's sins. There are no levels to sin, folks. Sin is sin. It is all an affront to God. Now, we might judge one to be higher than another, but, there, but if God was able to forgive my sin, He's able to forgive any of his sins. Because there is no difference. That's hard, though, isn't it? That's a hard concept. I still have trouble with that. I've, I've been back with the Lord for 27 years. I've made a lot of progress. I'm a minister of the gospel. I still have trouble with this concept. But it, 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 it doesn't make it any less true. There is nothing that God can't forgive as long as we repent and confess to God. So whoever that person is that you think can't be forgiven, you know, you know that one that you're actually not praying for right now? You need to be praying for that person. Because if God has justice, if you're praying justice on somebody else, remember that justice starts with the house of God. That's what Peter says. Peter says it is time for judgment to start with the house of the Lord. So if you want judgment out there, guess what? You're gonna you, you're asking for judgment on yourself as well. But if God was able to forgive you, you need to pray for forgiveness for other people, no matter how bad their sins are. I know that's not easy. That's that's master's degree course Christianity, right? <laughs> you know, I, I I like Christianity 101, right? Where I come back and I'm forgiven and I can and I can be mad at people who are worse than me, right? No, we gotta we gotta grow. We gotta grow beyond that. God wants us all to be mature and, and understand that his grace is extended to everyone. Jesus' blood was shed for everyone. Whether you whether you think they're worthy of it or not. Because the fact of the matter is you weren't worthy of it, and yet he extended his grace for you. Questions, comments? I know that's not easy. I know that's not easy. In case you're wondering, I understand that. But this is the truth. This is this is what God has called you to preach. We've got to learn these lessons. Because if, if we don't learn these lessons, we will never bring people to God. We will never be as effective as we can be for the kingdom of God. And that's what every one of us should want, right? Every one of us should want to, to bring people to Jesus. Every one of us should want heaven to be filled with the people that we affected in our lives. Even if those people are quote unquote terrible sinners. Matthew 11, 28 through 30 says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my, my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Do you notice what he said there? He said, all. So if you do a word study, right, you go into the Bible, it's very important to look at the original language that the Bible was written in, right? So if you go into the original language and you look up that word, you know what it's going to tell you? You know what it means? All. It means all. See, sometimes Bible study is easy. <laughs> all who are weary and Jesus calls everyone to come to repentance, guys. And we cannot afford to be making exceptions in our lives for people that we think don't deserve God's grace. Because the fact of the matter is, none of us has deserved God's grace, no matter how good you think you are. And I think that's the problem, because we all think we are so much better than those people. But we're not. That's, got, that, that's the realization that I think is the hardest to come to. Is to realize that we're all the same. I, I am the same as the worst sinner out there. The only thing, the only reason I'm here is by the grace of God. That's it. 
I'm not here because I'm a good person. I'm not. I'm not here because I'm an intelligent person. I am, but that's not what I'm here. <laughs> We're all here for that same reason. That's for right. the grace of God. That's right. That's that's the only reason. That's right. Jesus said that no one can come to me except the Father who sent me draw them, right? So you didn't come to Jesus because you on your own thought, you know what? I should come to Jesus. No, no, no. You didn't come to Jesus that way. You came to Jesus because the Father came to you and said, Come on. He said, Come to the cross. The Father was the one who drew you. You couldn't even find Jesus on your own. That's why Jesus refers to us as sheep, right? If a sheep wanders off, he can't find his way back. That's why the shepherd has to go looking for him or her. And that's why the shepherd has to put the sheep on his neck or on his shoulder and carry the sheep back. Because we don't know how to get to God. But praise be to God that we don't have to know because he will put us on his shoulder and he will bring us. Just as he has done for each and every one of us. We need, to extend, us to come to him. we need to extend that same mercy to the people around us. No matter what their sins happen to be. Amen? Amen. Anybody else? Final questions? Comments? You guys are having trouble with this, I can tell. <laughs> but I'll be praying for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just come to the name of Jesus. Lord God, help us to get this. Lord, help us to understand this love. Help us, Lord, to reach out with your loving grace to the world around us, Lord God. No matter what they're doing, no matter what they're doing, no matter how much they yell at us or, or tell us to go to go away, help us to never give up, Lord God. Just as you've never gave up on us. That is our prayer. Bless these people as they go. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, church.